What's up everybody? This is John Ross with Ross Racing here again for another video. We're going to do something a little bit different this time. For one thing, I got this fancy new self-stabilizing camera deal that my girlfriend got me for my birthday, so that's pretty cool. But the second thing that we're going to do different is a little bit of a different video format here. This is going to be a tool review video, but rather than doing like kind of the stereotypical rating on a 1 out of 10 sort of uh, tool review, what I'm planning on doing is showing you a handful of the tools that I have here in the shop that I use for engine building. I'm going to rate them into one of three categories. The first category, which would be the lowest priority, would be rent. In other words, it's a tool that you should rent and not buy. Now, where I'm at in the U.S., and hopefully where you're at, you might have access to something like uh, you know, an O'Reilly's or a Napa or whatever that has a tool rental program. And that's a really great resource for somebody who's just getting started in the hobby of working on cars or engines. Because you can go in, you pay them for the tool, but as long as you use it and bring it back within a couple days, they give you the whole purchase price back, so you're essentially just renting it. So the tools that fall into that first category are either ones you're not going to use very often, or they're ones that the price of buying one basically is disproportionately high to how often you're going to use it. Now the second category, the second highest priority that I'll rate a tool, would be skimp. In other words, buy the cheapest version of this tool that you can buy. And that might be because it's a really simple tool and there's no reason to pay big money for a name brand version of it. Or it might be because, again, it's something that you're not going to use that often, but maybe often enough to where it would be too much of a hassle to go back and forth to the auto parts store every time you want to rent one. The third category and the highest category would be splurge. In other words, buy the nicest version of this tool that you can afford. That's something that you're going to use all the time, or it's something where the precision of the tool is really critical, and you don't want to buy a cheap version because it's not going to get the job done. So with that in mind, let's start looking at some tools. I'm just going to grab stuff out of my toolbox in a random order. There's no real theme to this video other than today we're looking at engine building tools. If you like the idea, you know, maybe we'll do this for other kinds of tools, say suspension work or fabrication, that kind of thing, sometime in the future. So for the first tool that we have here, or rather more like a category of tools, we have the tools that you would use for the fine measurements that are necessary for building the bottom end of your engine. I would really give this whole category of tools a rating in the splurge region, the splurge category, because this is somewhere where you really don't want to be pinching pennies. The fine measurements that you take here are going to be the lifeblood of the durability and longevity of your engine. Of course, it is possible to do this, these kind of measurements on the cheap, what we've got here is Plastigage, which is basically just a piece of a long string of wax that you would pinch into the bearings and you measure using this scale that they come with on the wrapper. Measure how much that's compressed that gives you your clearances. A lot of good running engines and engines that lasted a long time have been built that way, but it's certainly not the most scientific way to do it. And it's not the way that any professional engine builder is going to do it. To do things right, you really got to at least have a micrometer for the, your typical kind of small block Chevy range of engine. A uh, two to three inch micrometer is really all you need. But you can also buy these in kits and, you know, get the whole wide range of ones that you would need for measuring just about anything up to, you know, the ten thousandth of an inch, which is what you have to do to be able to set your bearing clearances. This actually isn't the nicest micrometer you could buy, far from it. But it's also not the absolute, you know, bottom of the barrel Chinese version. And you definitely want to stay away from those because they're not going to be accurate or repeatable. Now you can use a set of snap gauges like this in combination with that micrometer to measure the, the ID of your bearings. If you're going to go that way, you definitely want to splurge on a nice set of these. These Harbor Freight ones that I bought, they're really not good enough for this. They're sticky no matter how much you lubricate them, and it makes it hard to get a good measurement. So if you're going to go that route, definitely splurge on a nice set of those. But the real best way to do this is with a dial bore gauge like we have here. Now you definitely don't want to go with a super cheap version of these either, because the cheapest ones that you find, say like on Summit, the no-name ones, they only measure down to the thousandth of an inch, or maybe at best a half a thousandth. In order to be able to set your bearing clearances accurately, you've got to be able to get one that measures to the ten thousandth, ten thousandth of an inch, so 0 .0001. This one was about 300 bucks. 
the really cheap ones you can get for about 100 but again those aren't really worth your time so the next tool that i'd like to look at is right here and that is good old-fashioned ring gapping tool or whatever you want to call it ring grinder piston ring grinder now this might be a controversial opinion but for me for just the average kind of hobbyist garage builder this is an area where you can skimp this one is actually probably the cheapest of uh, this style of grinder that you can buy uh, I think I got this one off Amazon or maybe eBay and it does the job just fine the key is really learning how to use these things and maybe you know practicing on some old piston rings before you really go to town on a, a nice new set of total seals like these we can do a whole video about that at some point but for right now you know I think this was like maybe a 10 or 15 dollar purchase and if you're a guy like the average you know kind of shop hobbyist that only maybe builds at most one or two engines a year you can definitely get your money's worth out of this versus spending the high dollars on say like a uh, you know like an electric automated one all right so i'm pretty excited about this next tool and this is going to be something a little bit different for us on the channel as well this is going to be a brand new tool unboxing video so what we have here is the valve spring compressor sc200 from LSM Racing Products. And this is something that I definitely splurged on. This thing was almost $400. But I got really tired of renting valve spring compressors from the auto parts store and having them not be able to handle the higher pressure springs that we use on our racing engines. For starters, this thing is packaged really nicely. And it comes fully assembled, which is awesome. That it's pretty badass. The threads feel really smooth, both on the on the keeper and on the valve side. It looks like, and I'll have to read the instructions, but I believe that you can actually use like a, like a small impact driver or something on that. Although I'm probably not going to. But basically, that side will sit against the face of the valve, and that side. And this is obviously for when the cylinder heads are removed. And this side will sit against the, uh, the keeper or the valve retainer and break that free so that you can remove your valve springs. All right, so let's go ahead and use this chunk of ability goodness to remove a valve spring and see how it does. One thing I noticed that I really like is both on both sides, the valve side and the keeper side, there's actual like skateboard bearings in there. So these are fully, fully floating. Uh, rotationally, which is nice. That's going to keep it from binding up. But it looks like uh, the use for at least for these springs, the use of like an impact socket or something would be totally unnecessary. You can pretty much do everything by hand. It's got a really nice feeling motion to everything. Everything moves nice and smooth, which you would expect from something at this price point. But we got her we got the slack taken out of it and that's all it takes you can really easily crank this thing with one hand squeezes that valve down no problem and of course here's another nice tool to have around this old magnetic deal that's great for getting those valve locks out of there and Unlike the cheapo auto parts store version of this tool, I can sit here with it compressed all day and I don't feel like it's about to pop loose and kill me. And you simply back her off. It's a little bit heavy and ungangly. I think you would need that heaviness and strength if you were using, say, like a you know, like a solid roller cam and lifter setup with ridiculous valve spring pressures to be able to not flex. It's a really overkill for what we're doing here. But I would say if you're gonna do your own cylinder head work and you're going to be working with springs that are significantly stiffer than you know just your stock run-of-the-mill springs, I would say it's definitely worth it to splurge on something like this because that saved a lot of hassle and pain and cursing of trying to make 
you know, so make a tool that's not designed to work with these springs work with these springs. Now we're going to go ahead and revisit my cylinder head work area here. There's a whole bunch of different tools here that we've been using recently. So after I did the uh, after I did the CCs on the combustion chamber, like you saw in the last video, I noticed that there was a couple of combustion chambers where they weren't sealing up perfectly. You know, there was a little bit of gas leaking through around the valves and getting down into the ports. And what I noticed was that there was a couple spots where a little bit of just surface rust had developed on the valve seats. So in order to remedy that, we got some lapping compound and a valve lapping tool, and I lapped the valves into these heads. And after that, they all sealed up perfectly. Now that's not going to fix like an actual bad valve seat, but something that's just a little bit of you know surface issue does a great job on. So this valve lapping tool, I guess I would put this in the skimp area because it's really simple. I think this one was like eight bucks at the auto parts store. There's no need to spend any more than that on a valve lapping tool. However, the valve lapping compound itself definitely splurge on the best stuff you can buy there. I mean, the difference is, you know, like three bucks for the cheap stuff versus 12 bucks for the good stuff. This good stuff is, let's see if it'll focus. Well, it's 280 grit. I think the cheap tube that you get is like 80 grit or something like that. There's never really a good reason to use a super aggressive grit like that for lapping valves because if it's bad enough that you got to remove that much material, you really probably should be getting a new seat cut or installed anyway. Of course, also over here at the station, we've got this uh, barrette, I believe is the correct pronunciation of that, that we use for measuring out the fluid, in this case gasoline, for CCing our chambers. That's also something that in the grand scheme of things you can skimp on, although the absolute cheapest way to do it would be, you know, just like a beaker. This is a little bit more expensive than that, but you don't need like a several hundred dollar laboratory grade setup. I think this setup with both the barrette and the stand was like 50 bucks off of Amazon. I would still consider that skimping in the grand scheme of things, knowing how much you can spend on laboratory grade equipment. While we're over here, let's take a look at another tool. This is good old fashioned trusty torque wrench. Of course, this isn't really, I guess, the old fashioned version because this is a digital one. Now this, I would say, is definitely a tool that you want to splurge on, but you don't have to splurge in terms of like spending the highest bucks you can find on like a, a snap-on or something. Actually, these Harbor Freight ones, they're pretty good. I've built several engines with this digital one, and their click versions aren't too bad either. So, you know, you're looking to spend probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 bucks to get a decent torque wrench, and you can certainly spend more than that, but for a hobbyist, you don't really have to. All right, so here we are at the Ross Racing Toolbox. We've got our, our engine tools deal, sponsored by St. Peter's Synthetic Oil. So let's just do kind of a rapid fire deal here, and uh, we'll pull out a bunch of stuff and say what category it falls into. So here we've got an oil filter cutter. I would say for this, Really just having one of these in general is kind of splurging, so I guess I'd say splurge on these. Go for something like this one that's a solid billet design. Even this was only, I think, 45 bucks or something like that. Definitely worth it. Uh, you want to be cutting open your oil filters after every oil change if you're racing to look for debris. So this gets a lot of use. I mean, we're talking at least every other week. What else have we got in here? So we've got various tools involved. Um, these will show a little bit more detail on how they're used later. But various tools involved with setting up your cylinder heads. Uh, this is a installed height micrometer that you would use for setting the installed height of your valve springs. We've got this, uh, this spring checker, I guess you would call it, that you use for uh, checking the installed tension of your valve springs. This rocker arm I use in combination with that because it doesn't clamp good onto the, the style of rocker arms that we have to use. And I believe somewhere over here, things are kind of a massive mess right now with uh, being in the middle of building an engine. There she is. We've also got this tool, 
which is used for checking the tension in combination with that installed height mic. You can use that to check the tension of a spring at basically any given point in its cycle, whether that's on the seat or wide open or whatever. For those tools, if you're going to invest in basically building your own cylinder heads, I would definitely say you should splurge on those. However, if you're a guy that's just getting started, maybe you're just buying, you know, pre-built cylinder heads, you know, maybe just stick with something like this, which you can, I would say this is even the skimpier version of. This is about 100 bucks versus like the four or $500, you know, uh, digital versions. Now we're going to get into probably the first tool that I would put in the rental category if you're just getting started, and that is the harmonic balancer removal tool and the harmonic balancer install tool. Now I own these just because I got tired of going back and forth to the store, but in reality, you don't use those often enough and they're cheap enough and easy enough to get from the store for a rental that it doesn't really do you that much good to own them. If you're building a lot of engines, obviously all of these tools you want to buy at some point. One last thing out of the toolbox here, this is a compression tester. And that's something that you can definitely skimp and get a cheaper one on. Obviously, you don't want something that's a complete Chinese piece of junk. But just the cheaper one that you can get from the auto parts store is plenty. All this really does is give you kind of a rough idea of the health of your cylinders, your rings and valve seals and whatnot. You're not really going to be using it for like fine diagnostic work. So you can scamp and get a cheaper version of this tool. So those are a few of the tools that we have in the shop and how I'd rate them. Now obviously something that I would rate solidly into the, uh, into the rent range, I'm not going to have around because it's something that I would rent myself. A couple of examples of that would be one, a radiator or a cooling system pressure tester. Those are generally really pricey, but it's a good thing to have, especially when you're about to do the break-in on a new engine, because it lets you check for any coolant leaks before you fire the engine up. So I would definitely, uh, I would definitely rate that as something that you should rent. Also, uh, similarly, would be a leak-down tester. Those are also fairly pricey, but it's a good thing to have as a diagnostic tool. Uh, if that compression gauge that I showed you earlier doesn't give you a clear answer, then a leak down tester can tell you if you have like a bad, uh, you know, bad valve or a burnt valve or something like that uh, versus say just like a ring problem or something like that. So that's something that you could definitely rent from your local auto parts store versus buying. Well, there you have it, a, a rundown of some of the tools that we use here in the shop and how I would rank them on a scale of rent, skimp, or splurge. I hope you guys liked that format, thought that it was good. You know, if you didn't or if you disagree with, uh, you know, how I would rate some of these tools, feel free to leave a comment. Or if you like it or you do agree or you have some suggestions for other tools that you'd like me to look at and rate in this way, definitely leave that a com as a comment as well. Uh, in the meantime, please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the videos that we're making. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you back here for the next one.